in life. We recognize that there's some things that we can't do ourselves or for ourselves. The major service on a car, I'm not changing my timing belt. The legal documentation of buying a house, I don't know what all those pages are all about. Medical surgery on our bodies. Anyone else tried to do a DYO knee replace, DIY, DIY knee replacement? No, don't. Witness a stat deck signature on your own documents. Do the electrical wiring in your own home. Can't do that. Pack your own groceries. Some of you can't do that. We need a professional. Sometimes we try these things. We want to try and figure it out for ourselves. You know, we get on the YouTubes. We watch a video. We say, praise the Lord for YouTubes, teaching me how to do stuff. I now know how to change the oil in my car, and I can pay myself $100 an hour to undo that bolt and screw it back in. Don't forget about the screwing it back in. Not that any of you have not forgotten to do that. We know there are some things in life that are best left to the experts. And there's some things that are mandated that they are left to the experts. We are familiar with these circumstances in the, in the, where there's times in our life where we have to turn to and trust someone else, someone that has the skill, someone that has the tools, someone that has the clearance and the credentials, someone that has been given permission and the authority to do that job. In 2024, we accept that. We're used to that. This is our attitude to many things in our daily lives. So let me ask you this. What is your attitude toward your soul? What is it that you believe about how your soul, your soul is going to be best cared for and looked after? If someone could view your soul's service history or do a health check or an audit, audit in what mechanisms are you putting your trust in order for it to be viewed as good to go? See, what is revealed to us in Hebrews chapter 7 are conditions in which your soul is best looked after. What you discover in Hebrews 7 is how God, who made your soul, has regulated a system for your soul to be right. It's a system where you have to have someone else do some work for you. You need someone who has the skill. You need someone who has the tools. You need someone who has the clearance and the credentials, who has permission to perform the work, to work on your behalf, on behalf of your soul. So your soul isn't something that you can simply jump on the YouTubes in order to sort it all out on your own. As much as you would like to think that, oh, I'm a good person, or I agree with some of the teachings of the Bible, as much as you might think that that is going to be good enough for your soul to be spotless and safe, that work that you are doing on your own doesn't cut it. It's not enough. Your soul is set within God's decided circumstances in which you have to turn and trust someone else. What we read in Hebrews 7 is about God's design for our souls. It's for our soul's spotlessness and for our soul's safety. And what we read about in Hebrews 7 is not a new thing. Hebrews 7 is one of those chapters in the book of the Bible, the book of Hebrews, that gets you amped for the Old Testament, the whole story of God. Like you read Hebrews 7 and you're like, oh, that's what Genesis is all about. That's what they were doing through Judges. That's what's going on in all of these amazing stories that I read in Sunday school. They now begin to make sense. God has always, what we discover in chapter, Hebrews chapter 7 is God has always been pro having professionals being representatives for people's soul. It's always been God's plan. It's always been God's way. The Bible, the Bible describes these professionals as priests. Priests. Now, for a moment, I've said this before, I need you to get out of your head. You know, the, the caught up in the scandal, nine years priest wearing a white collar day and age priest. You know, need to get you out of your head all of those, you know, self-appointed priests of modern religions and made-up religions, okay? We're going back to like 
early ancient Near East history. Priests for God's people, Israel. And they were God's appointed, prayerful go-betweens on behalf of the people. Priests were God's butchering, God God, uh, butchering, blood sprinkling, announcers of blessing. We got it, three Bs. It looked good on paper. So, Priests are God's selected people to act on behalf of humanity in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Priests were called to guard God's holy places and to cultivate places for people to encounter God. Summary statement, a priest is called to represent God to the people and a priest is called to represent the people to God. Mediator, back and forth, standing in the gap. Specifically, the priest's representation was in relation to people having right standing before God, to have spiritual, moral, soul purity before God. Holiness is a Bible word. Righteousness is a Bible word. A soul that God looks on and says, nice, just like me. The priest had a very important role to make up for the many ways in which we are not, our souls are not nice or just like God's. The priest's role was to make up, to make up for the saying, oh, I'm only human. The priest's role was to make up for the saying, oh, look, nobody's perfect. The priest's role was to hit control Z on our misdemeanors. If there was no priest, if there is no priest, there is no way for soul purification so you can have proximity for intimacy and ecstasy in knowing God. The Bible teaches is that where there is any sin or immorality or filth that is associated with a person's soul, that is any word, thought or deed that does not meet God's vibe check, The owner of that soul has no chance of being satisfied in God. There will be no approach. There will be no true, real joy, hope, peace or purpose. There will be no life because you cannot draw near to the one who is the source of all joy, hope, peace, purpose and life. You will never know true love because you'll never be able to draw near to the source of love. No priest, no way of going to God. And guess what? That's not what God wants. God does not want distance from those that he loves. God wants relationship with those that he loves. The whole story of the Bible is God's relentless pursuit of, of his people coming at great cost to him. His radical love towards his created people. And what you read in the Bible from the very beginning is God has called priests to be an essential part of his plan for us and for him to have relationship. Now, this doesn't get taught in your uh, schools these days. RE is out. No, not cool anymore. But what you would have learnt, or what you can learn from the Bible, is that there's a pretty striking visual illustration and ceremony that God once had for his people to participate in, to symbolise the reconnection of the relationship that God wants with his people. Do you know what that is? The Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, what's that? It's led by the priests. Atonement, what is atonement? Atonement is at one It's to be rejoined. It's to be at one again with God. Relationship, hold the little black button for nine seconds, reset. People and God reconciled, joined back together. 
rejoined to God once again, fresh start. What do you know about the Day of Atonement? Do you know what the priest was doing on the Day of Atonement? See, they were the professionals being the, representat- being the representatives for people's soul. That was, the, that was the day for the priests. Grand final day is the Day of Atonement for the priests. The priests standing in the gap, going in on behalf of God's generation. You know the Day of Atonement? It's a big deal. Big deal. The priest, you know, they're at the temple or they're at the tabernacle. Big deal. They're at the place, the meeting place with God. And the priest, he gathers. He gathers firstly all the people of God. All right, people of God, come on. We're doing the day. Day of Atonement. One day a year, come on. Come on in. We've got some sacrifices to make. Day of Atonement. Do you want to be reconciled with God? Do you want to restore the the joy forevermore from knowing God. Come on, come on around, everyone, come on. And the people are like, yes, we need to come. We need to come. We need to re- repair the relationship. We need, we're going to participate in this thing that the priest is doing on our behalf. We're going to stand by and we're going to be part of this. And the priest, what's he do? Goes and gets a bull. Come here, Mr. Bull. Yep, you sit right there. Sit down. Sit, sit. Oh, wait, no, you're not a dog. You're a bull. Stand there. Bull, tied him up. Bull goes and gets two, go- two goats, blemish free. Come on, goat, Jono. Oh, good looking goat you've got here, Jono. Thank you. Put the goat over here next to the bull and another goat next to the bull. Bull, goat, goat, two rams as well. Okay? So you've already got, you know, you've got a petting zoo at the start of the Day of Atonement. And then the priest, in front of everyone, what's he do? He has a bath. Yeah, not weird. Takes out his normal dress, gets, starts the ceremonial washing, cleansing. I'm going to go in to meet God. I'm going to have a shower. Got to look good. Got to get ready. Yeah. Then puts on his ceremonial dress. He puts on simple, humble dress. You know, the linen garments. You know, the, you know linen, it's good, breathable. It allows him to do what he's about to do next, which is, you'll see. It's going to get dirty. So the priest is all dressed up. Now, Mr. Bull, you come with me. That's it. Come over here, Mr. Bull. Okay. Come here. You wait there. Tie the bull and uh, come over here. I'm going to take now, takes the knife. Okay, Bull, uh, could someone flick? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff, can you grab me that bucket, please? Yep, thank you. Bucket, Bull, bucket, knife. You know the rest, okay? We're not going to actually do it, but imagine it. It's good to imagine it. Capture the blood from the slaughtered Bull. What's the Bull for? The bull is the sacrifice for the priest's sin. The bull is the sacrifice for the priest's sin, for his own dirty soul. What's he do now? He's got his bucket, bucket of blood. Okay, priest is like, all right, guys, I'm going in. Goes in, most holy place. He's in the whole, most holy place. His finger in, flicking the blood. Blood over there. How many times? Oh, six, was five, six, seven, seven. Oh, gee, I hope I haven't stuffed that up. Flicking blood everywhere, getting bloody. Comes back out seven times, cleansing for his sin. Okay, the priest is good. He can go back in there next time. All right, priest got his clearance pass now, got his ticket. He's able to go in and out now on this day, Day of Atonement. All right, priest forgiven, cleansed. All right, priest, get on with the job. We've got all these people watching on. They want, they want, Forgiveness for their sin too. They want cleansing and reconciliation, atonement too. So the priest comes over. You, goats, come with me. Two goats. Come, come you stupid goat. I mean, you beautiful goat. Yeah, that's, that's it. Puts the goats down there, reaches into his back linen pocket, grabs out the dice. Actually, no, coin, coin. All right, goat, coin. Heads or tails? Flip. And All right. Sorry, Mr. Black Goat. Um, you stay here, and brown goat, you come over here. Yeah, trust me, brown goat, you're the lucky one. You wait there. Wait there, brown goat. All right, black goat, I'm over here, please. Yes, next to the bull. That's right. Yeah, you know what's coming. Uh, where'd that bucket go? Oh, that's right. It's over here. Bucket down underneath the goat. Okay, goat, and oh, get down. And bam, there we go. Go, and then capture the blood in the bucket. Good. Sacrifice too made. That goat is for the sins of the people watching on. Gee, I'm glad the goat has died in my place. Has taken now this blood of the goat. Goat number two. And now he goes back in. He's collected the blood and now goes back in to the holy place. 
flicking the sin around. Okay, God, this one is for the people. Okay, on the mercy seat over there. Yep, over on the horns. Great. All right. Oh, gee. All right, back out again. And he comes back out much to the people's appreciation that the priest is still doing his thing. Okay, so far, everything acceptable. What's next? Okay, well, now the people have seen. The priest has had his sins cleansed, forgiven, atoned for. The people have had their sins forgiven, cleaned, atoned for. The the dead bull and the dead goat represent death in their place, substitutionary atonement. What about this other goat over here? Well, this was all part of God's plan. You can read about all this. I'm just reenacting Leviticus 16. This is all that's happening. Walking over here. All right, goat. All right, now, people, all your sins, your confessed sins. Goat, where's your head? Okay. Put the hand of the, the head on the hand on the head of the goat, and the priest confesses the sins of the people. He is metaphorically transferring the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. Puts all of the sins. All right, you know everything. It's got God, we put our sins on this one. It is no longer. We're transferring them to this goat. Okay, goat, turn around, edge of the camp, boom, off you go. Get no goat. Bye-bye, goat. You, do you want to end up like him? Get going. Goat scuttles away. Scapegoat. Carries the sins. As far as the east is from the west, the sins are gone. Carried away by the goat. 110% sure now that if the blood didn't make it obvious that your sins are taken away, now they're being sent away. Priest comes back. Bull, goat. Goat's away. All right, Okay. Man, I am, a, I am in a mess now. I've got blood everywhere, okay? Back to the bathing thing, strip off the clothes again, bathe, wash off the blood. Oh, gee, always, blood is so hard to get out of your hair, isn't it? Oh, bull's blood. Puts back on his regulation dress, comes back out. Is that done? No, sin's taken away. The people have just witnessed this ceremony that God has given His people so that they can be forgiven. Holy moly, we have a fresh start with God. Bring in the lamb, rams. Bring in the rams. We're going to like, now we're going to dedicate our lives in thankfulness and joy and give to God these sacrificial rams. All right, one for the priests, one for the people. Rams, burnt offering for God as a symbol of dedication for the people back to God again. God, we're so thankful for the fresh start. We're so thankful that you've overlooked our sin. We're so thankful for the purification of our souls. We're so so thankful that we have been reconciled with you. We're so thankful that you've given us a priest to do all of that because I don't want to do that on my own. And we offer you these blameless, innocent, set-apart rams as a token of our gratitude. And this is our sacrifice back to you. Thank you so much. And then last, the priest delegates. He's like, Yes, please. Um, yep, Heather, can you please take the, the bull and the ram and can you please burn them outside the camp? Burn everything. Burn it all. Day of atonement. Grand final day. Once a year for the high priest. Once a year for the relationship between God and humanity to be reset. Left to the professional. Performed only by the priest on behalf of the people of God. That priest is not self-appointed. He would have been a Levite from the tribe tribe of Levi. Uh, He would have uh, been called from that tribe to be a priest. And all those people, the people of God who stood by and watched on in the Day of Atonement, what's going on in their minds? What's going on? They were standing there firstly watching. There was no drop off your soul at the service station and come back at four o'clock to pick it up again. It's all nice and tidy. Thank you very much. Uh Uh-uh. Were you able to put yourself in their shoes? It's a little reenactment of Leviticus 16. See, the people were gathered together near the tabernacle, watching and waiting for the priests to complete the rituals, knowing that the outcome of this whole day of atonement was going to impact them all. Gee, I hope my lawyer knows, has a good argument here. Gee, I hope the paperwork's been signed properly. Gee, I hope that the mechanic has put the plug back into the oil sump. They stood, they stood together as a community that had fasted, that had prayed, that had sacrificially given, and now they were watching on as one. And they would have been thinking. They would have been thinking about their sinfulness, They would have been 
thinking about their need for mercy. They would have been reflecting on their dependence on this special day for their relationship with God to continue and for blessing to continue to flow. The whole ceremony would have led them. They would have experienced moments of awe and fear, recognizing the holiness of God and their unworthiness to be in his presence. The death of the bull, if that doesn't happen, then the priest can't go in for me. The priest goes, the death of the bull, if I don't do that, I'm dead. The death of the goat, if that doesn't happen, then that's what's coming to the people of God. Every time the priest came out of the holy place after flicking the blood, it would have been relief and hope as the people knew that there was another successful step in being forgiven and cleansed and symbolically having their sins sent away so they had another chance to live for God in his love, mercy and grace. Put yourself in their shoes. Now ask, what do you reckon their posture was? What was their heart, mind, and soul posture? I reckon you can sum it up in two words. Honesty and humility. Honesty and humility. See, they were honest with themselves if they were standing by and watching on, weren't they? They were freely admitting, my soul isn't pure. It's tarnished. I need help. I need soul cleansing. I need soul restoration. I need to be at one again with God. Honesty and humility. It's humility there too, wasn't there? Humility. They were humble enough to acknowledge that in the face of their soul's accumulated filth, they were humble enough to say, I can't save me. I don't want to have what it takes to renew the relationship. I don't have what it takes. I can't just be a good person. I can't just do that. I need God's appointed professional. I need a priest. They were humble enough to admit that I need a priest. And so they watched and they hoped. Honesty and humility. Honesty and humility. This is not a common posture of today, is it? Honesty and humility. See, it doesn't look good in the eyes of the world today, does it? Honesty and humility. To admit your hopelessness, your neediness, and your incapacity. You know, that doesn't get likes on social media, does it? You know? Look how successful I am at being hopeless. Like, subscribe, share that one. Many people today would say, nah, we've outgrown all this. People would say today that the priest's profession, the priest, the priestly thing, God's priestly thing, man, that's old. That's archaic. The slaughtering of animals, blood everywhere. That isn't how you restore a relationship with God anymore. No. See, we're enlightened modern day individuals, people would say. We've moved on. We've got our morality. We've got our slogans. Have you seen our bumper stickers? Have you seen the pins that we wear on our lapels? That's not how I read the Bible now. You know, you have to put it now and understand its historic context for what it meant just for them, just then, just back then. It has nothing to do with us anymore. We've got something better. Really? See, Hebrews 7, that's where we still are. Hebrews 7, in responding to those thoughts, would say, you're wrong. You're wrong. God has always been pro having professionals being representatives on people's, on people's behalf for their souls. God's words remain that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. That without the shedding of blood, the death of the bull and the goats, there is no forgiveness of sin. And that's why the pastor who writes the book of Hebrews That's why the pastor who writes the book of Hebrews, he can't stop 
talking about Jesus. He can't stop talking about Jesus. He says, you, you want to know Jesus, guys. You want to focus in on Jesus. Stuff hasn't changed, but Jesus has now arrived. The author of Hebrews, the pastor of Hebrews, he, he wants you to know, don't settle for anything less than Jesus. Don't be satisfied with anyone other than Jesus. Jesus is better, better than anything ever. Follow him with unwavering faith and endurance. Align yourself with what he is doing. And if you do, you'll discover that his direction will meet your deepest longings. Jesus, who is he? Hebrews 7 tells us that he is the professional priest for us. Not just the high priest, the great high priest. And Hebrews 7 wants you to grasp his great high priestness. Today, we need to hear that your soul has available to it a priest, the greatest priest, the greatest ever priest. Do you know Jesus as the great high priest? Let's think about Jesus as today's great high priest. See, what the guy and uh, what the author of Hebrews does is he compares Jesus to the Genesis 14 priest, the OG priest, the king priest, Melchizedek. Jesus, he says, is a priest, just like Melchizedek. Now I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I know all about Melchizedek. Been doing devos all week about Melchizedek. No, that's what you're thinking. You're thinking, who the heck is Melchizedek? That's what you're thinking. See, we first meet Melchizedek at the very beginning of your Bible in Genesis chapter 14. See, the story goes that Abraham has received his blessing from God. He's with his nephew, Lot. Um, At this point, uh, Lot and Abraham have now parted ways. Abraham has been like, Lot, you take whatever part you like. And then God says to Abram, good work, mate. You can have all of that. They go their separate ways. Now, um, it's a little bit of a random chapter, really. But what happens is, is with all this that's going on, Abraham's now settled down, Lot's settled down, and there's a bunch of argy-bargy going on around, the, around them. There's a bunch of kings fighting. They want more land. They want power. They want to conquer. And there's alliances going on, and they're fighting it out. And then what happens is there's a bit of fighting that's happening near Lot, and then Lot ends up getting taken hostage by these kings that have been winning this war, and it's taken away. And then they're just... and then they. Abraham finds out that his nephew has been captured by these kings. And he's like, that's not good. He says, so he goes and gets, so you've got to understand here, there's kings that have been making alliances and alliances and they've fought a battle and the, the victor is now off this way, taken lot. And Abraham's like, well, that's no good. All right, you, 318 of my own men, because Abraham has been blessed by God, right? You know, you know land, blessing, descendants, okay? Abraham is doing pretty well for himself. as sort of God's appointed, you know, promised person in the whole thing. So he takes 318 of his men. He hunts down this king who's got Lot and he rescues Lot. So just if that's not a flex on Abraham's part, it's just like all these kings having a war and it's just like, oh, just come on guys, come on. Yeah, we'll show them who's really powerful. And then bam, he gets them, takes Lot home. Now on the way home from this war, right? So Abraham's, he's, I imagine he's pretty tired, you know, he's met says, I'm going to read for you from Genesis 14. It says, after his return from the king from the, the defeat of Shedolaramer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him, Abraham, at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, there he is, king of Salem, Salem is ancient Jerusalem, Salem, Jerusalem, it's ancient Jerusalem, king of Salem, now that should be, you know, like Jerusalem, that's like significant in the Bible, right? Yeah, Jerusalem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. What? So God still has got priest things happening in Genesis 14. What's going on there? Anyway, I just think that's fascinating. Like God's got a little priest side hustle going on in the story of, you know, just his people. And Melchizedek blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. All right. So Abram meets Melchizedek. And so we're sort of under... Abram is obviously, he can flex, right? He's just beat all these kings. He's coming back with his spoils of war. And then somehow Melchizedek, the king priest of Salem, meets him 
And I'm just like, this guy's legit. Have 10% of everything of all the spoils. I'm, you, are, you are clearly a man of God. You are clearly representing what God is. Have 10%. Here's my tithe, mate. There you go. 10%. Abraham blesses him. And Melchizedek meets him with bread and wine on the way. Now, Melchizedek, okay, the author's going to tell us a little bit about Melchizedek in chapter 7, all right? Because where Melchizedek is awesome, Jesus is awesomer, more awesome, the most awesome, the awesomest. Anyway, someone, any English teachers here? Don't talk to me afterwards because you'll make me feel bad. No, you can talk to me. I will, we'll, we'll chat about English. No, we won't. We won't talk about work. We'll talk about Jesus and how good Jesus is. All right. Melchizedek in Hebrews 7. Oh, dear. Stay in your notes. Okay. He's the king of Salem, king of Jerusalem, which means king of peace. All right. So Melchizedek, king of peace. And then he's also called the king of righteousness. That is rightness. That is always doing the perfect thing all the time. King of righteousness. That's a good thing. Now we go, okay. Melchizedek, king of peace, king of righteousness. Who does that sound like? Righteousness, peace. Jesus, anyone? Isaiah 9, the declaration, the prophecy of who Jesus is going to be when he's born. You know, if you've ever done a Christmas service here in the last five years, you will have heard this one. Isaiah 9, for us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, that's our Jesus, of the increase of his government, this is like king, authority language, and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice, with righteousness, there's that word, from this time and forevermore. That's just Jesus' job description as king. All right, Melchizedek and Jesus. Oh, okay, we're starting to see... a a trend here. Melchizedek is the very first king priest. And then Jesus is the new and better king priest. Jesus is being effectively adopted into the line of Melchizedek, is what Hebrews 7 is saying. Because technically, Jesus couldn't have been a priest under the 12 tribes, right? If you know anything about Bible history, you know that only the Levites could become a priest. What's, where, what line was Jesus born into? He was born into the line of David in the tribe of Judah. So he's, he's like got Judah descendant. He's a Judah descendant, which means he's in the kingly line. But he can't be a priest. And the author is just like, mate, I see that, but I'm going to raise you one Melchizedek. So Jesus is both the rightful king and a rightful priest. A legitimate king and a legitimate priest. Now, perhaps you've noticed here, hopefully you notice this. So far, we're only talking about kings, right? Hopefully you've noticed that Jesus' designation is royalty. Same for Melchizedek. Now, do you remember the role of the priest? Like, not a glamorous job. <laughs> not a glamorous job. Like, it's a bloody, risky ritual. The priest is like a frontline soldier whose PD is, the, is a hybrid of like a family lawyer and a butcher. <laughs> God's ultimate priest. You look at now God's ultimate priest and he's a king priest. Now this will tell you something about God. See, God is getting his anointed king to be also his appointed priest. See, God, as God's as God doesn't want his king, God is not a king who is sitting back, getting served, getting someone to peel his grapes. God is a king who is the one who is going in and doing the sacrificing, who's getting the blood on him, who's doing the work on behalf of his people. Jesus does the sacrificing and the sacrificing that the priests would have made. Jesus is the king priest, the king priest. Now, what do you know about the life of Jesus? Where do we see in the life of Jesus as you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you know, the the biographies of Jesus' life? Where do we see Jesus slaughtering a bull? Where do we see Jesus killing off the two goats, killing off one goat and sending out another? Where in human history does that occur? 
Well, firstly, if you pay attention to Jesus' life, you realize he doesn't need a bull, mate. What's the bull for? The bull is for the sacrifice, is a sacrifice on behalf of the priest's sin. Do you know anything about Jesus? Sinless. No sin. The great God man who committed no wrong. Holy, righteous, the exalted one. He doesn't need a bull. He's just like, you stay there, Jeff. Leave your bull. Don't need a bull. I can go in and out anytime. That's what makes me a great priest. And then we go, okay, well, what about when Jesus offers the goats? What about when all the people are gathered and looking at Jesus on their metaphorical day of atonement? Where's the goat that he's going to kill? Where are the goats? So usually the people, you would have to select an unstained, innocent, free animal to take their place in the shedding of blood. The ceremony that represented the substitutionary atonement. That had to happen, didn't it? And that ritual, the cutting of the goat's throat and collecting its blood for the blood to cleanse people of their sin, that ritual would have reminded the people that the goat was absorbing the punishment for their impure soul and dies in their place. Something else died instead of them. Now, where's Jesus' goat? For us. Well, Jesus, he is the something else. He's the someone else. See, Jesus is the goat. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to make a cute, you know, he's, he is the goat. He is the greatest of all time. All right. You know, let's just step past that one. Funny, funny, funny. But this is as, as about as a serious as I get. Jesus is the goat. Jesus is the goat who dies. Jesus is the once for all sacrifice, the perfect, the perpetually perfect replacement of all goats to ever come. He's the perfect, ultimate, unstained, innocent sacrifice. Except it's not a fancy day of atonement where this takes place, is it? It's not a bunch of people that are crowded around, hoping and praying that the high priest would come back out successful in making atonement for their sins and reconnecting them to God. It's not a priest that is ceremonially doing this ritual in order that God's people may have their souls purified. No. It's on a cross. Yeah, happy Easter, Good Friday. Jesus gets tortured, beaten, mocked, bloodied, bruised, the cat and nine tails across his back, flesh torn from his very bones. He goes and he's pinned to a cross. He's lifted up and people aren't praying for him. People aren't, people aren't longing for him to come away from that alive and well for their forgiveness of sins the crowd is shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And he slowly bleeds out and suffocates in his own blood. Because he's the goat. He's the perfect sacrifice, innocent, unstained, exalted. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Peter, his disciple, said, the Roman soldier at the crucifixion of Jesus says when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. He was the unstained one. Peter describes him as the one who was without blemish or spot. In him, he knew no sin. He was the holy one. The angel declaring to Mary before his birth, a child will be called holy, the son of God. Even the demons in the spiritual realm knew Jesus' PD. I know who you are, the holy one of God, they would say. And he is the exalted one. God exalted him and bestowed upon him the name is above every name. He is the great king, the greatest king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who goes and dies. 
See, the priest that God selects to represent us before God is God who becomes a priest. And the sacrifice that God selects to die and satisfy God is God the Son who becomes the sacrifice. And you might be thinking that after all this blood and slaughter, crucifixion and priestly business, one might think, man, God's a maniac. This blood-crazed, sacrificial psychopath. But God is none of those things at all. See, God always knew that for him to be both perfectly righteous, that is just, fair, and morally pure, and for him also to be merciful, loving, and faithful to us, he knew that for him to be both the, Romans 3, the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, God knew that he would always one day be giving of himself. That he would take the hit. God has always been pro having professionals being representatives for people's souls. And God's design for your soul, for your soul's spotlessness and safety, was always for him to take on that responsibility. That's how loving he is. That's how good a father he is. God's design for your soul's spotlessness and safety was for him to do it for you. And for you to simply entrust yourself to him for him to do that. To trust him in heart, mind and soul. In a posture of what? Honesty and humility. Do you recognize your soul as of being in need of a priest? Can you be honest with yourself and recognize that there's work to do on your heart and in your mind and in your soul that you simply can't do on your own? Can you see a need within yourself to just that you have to stop? trying to represent yourself to God and instead put on humility and ask Jesus to represent you for you. Jesus is the one with the skill. Jesus is the one who has the tools. Jesus is the one that has the clearance and the credentials. He's the one that's been given permission to do that job. And the good news of his appearing His entrance onto the stage of human history is that because of his great love, he offers himself to you free of charge. Free of charge. How do you know? How do you know that this is a blessing coming to you, not something that you're having to earn or deserve, but that Jesus freely hands that out towards you? How do you know? How do you know that Jesus will will accept us? It's the exact same way that we knew that Melchizedek, that Abraham knew that he was accepted by Melchizedek. In the bread and the wine. In the bread and the wine. Did you catch that? Melchizedek came out to Abram after the battle. Melchizedek met him with bread and wine. Man, there's a five-week preaching series in this, that loaded verse. The bread and the wine. Now, do you know how bread and wine would... Let's just think about it culturally for a moment. Bread and wine in that culture back then, the gift of food and drink was more than just physical nourishment. It wasn't just Melchizedek saying like, yeah, you've just fought a battle. You look thirsty. Have a drink, mate. It was a symbol of hospitality and welcome and acceptance. It was a genuine gesture of friendship, even honor. Bread and wine to form a bond for a lifetime. 
eating food together, sitting at the table together, a a family-type image, one of love and warmth, connection and longevity. And you know Melchizedek, we've been thinking today, he's the beta version of Jesus. And he shows up in the first book of the Bible so that Jesus can show up to us today. And through the act of the Lord's Supper, in the same way, we remember that Jesus is for us. He is here for friendship, even honour. In the reminder of the bread and wine, we reflect on the bond that he has made to us for eternal life. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before his crucifixion, he took bread and he broke it. He says, this is my body, which is given to you. This is my body. Picture the goat, which is given to you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup. He says, the cup is the symbol of the the covenant in my blood, the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of sin. It's no longer going to be the blood of the goat that you flick around in the most holy place. It is a a symbolic reminder that you take my blood onto and into you. And you know that now, thousands, hundreds of years later, we still get the reminder of the bread and the wine. We still get to partake in this table-like posture of honour, welcome and gesture of acceptance and love. And Jesus simply saying, do you need forgiveness for your soul? Do you need to find purification? Do you want to find at one with God? Do you need to do that for the first time? Or do you just need to remember it again for the 1500th time? Come to the table. The only thing you've got to do is just trust that I'm going to serve it to you. (laughs) And you just have to receive it. You just have to receive it. So we've got our hospitality team. They're going to come around now. I felt that it would be appropriate that after what we've been thinking about in Hebrews 7, that we would partake in the bread and in the wine. And this is a meal for those of you that you would say, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I have put my trust in the blood of the goat, in the blood of the lamb, in the blood of Jesus Christ. This is for you to have a moment to remember and be like, gee, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are the priest that goes in on my behalf that you are the sacrifice that is the better sacrifice, that you are my king that is serving me. (laughs) So if you're a follower of Jesus here today, I would encourage you to take the cup, take the bread. Maybe you're here today, you've never done this before, but after what you've heard today, you've connected some dots. Or maybe you've even formed some dots for the first time and made a connection for the first time. Please use this time as the first way that you respond to God as Melchizedek came to Abraham and gave him bread and wine. Accept that, receive that. And say, Jesus, thank you. This changes everything. If you are going in on my behalf, thank you. And then be prepared to sacrifice the rams. Then be prepared to dedicate the rest of your life to God.